Ladies and gentlemen, well that's four o'clock. Um, what I never considered was that obviously this would read backwards um, on the on the laptop camera, but there we go. So this is Earth Live um, on Lizzie Daly's World Life TV channel, and I'm your guest host today, Andy Torbett. And if you could read that, what that says is being an aquanaut. So who am I? What is that? So as well as doing the things I do professionally, so as a mountain climber and caver and skydiver um, a presenter, I also am a diver. <clears throat> and if an astronaut is someone who goes into space to explore, an aquanaut is someone who goes underwater to explore. So the aqua part is the important bit. And what I'd like to do today is just talk very briefly, we've got about 20 minutes or so, to discuss... Um, you know, why I do it, but but why it's important that we go and explore this inner space, this, this alien planet we have on Earth, because you've got to remember that we call it planet Earth, but actually 70% of it is covered by water. So that water environment is really important. And I'll speak a little bit about the equipment I use uh, and some of the places I've been and the different things you can explore underwater. Because what's key is that these days, it's becoming harder and harder to be a genuine explorer on land, to go somewhere where no one else has been before. But underwater, there is masses still to do, and it's really easy to do it. You don't need the high-tech kit I'll speak about. Anyone can do it, and I'll come on to that uh, later um, today. I should say that, as we all should be, unless we're key workers, I am pretty much trapped in my house. Uh, with my five-year-old and three-year-old. So if you do hear some shouting and screaming, that's my that's my kids. Um, so, now you can obviously explore underwater using equipment like this, which is an, an ROV, a remote operating vehicle. It's based in underwater drone, big camera on the front, and it'll go underwater and transmit pictures back where you can sit safely in a boat and look at all the stuff. And that's okay. And as well as that, obviously you can use Things like this, uh, one-man submarines or, or even uh, uh, two-man, three-man submarines. And I've used these, I've piloted these underwater in places in the Mediterranean, and they're great. But it's still not the same. It's, it's the difference between, between flying a spaceship and walking on the moon, because to really explore somewhere, you want to get up close and personal with it. And actually, on occasions, um, sometimes this, the ROVs, the submarines, they just can't go where we as human beings can go underwater. Now, underwater is an alien world. It is just like going to outer space, and therefore we are completely reliant on the technology that we carry with us when we are um, when we are exploring underwater. And there's been some development in that over the years. So this is um, this is quite an old piece of technology. This was sort of over a hundred years old, but uh, this is me using it in a cave system in the UK. Big hard helmet, with an air hose to the surface that um, pumps air down. We've just seen who's who's appearing. So I will ask, answer some, some questions popping up, and I'll, I'll get to questions at the end. Fear not. So a big helmet there pumps air down, and you can breathe. And that's been around for over a hundred years, but technology's moved on. In fact, it's moved on as far as something like this. He says, he gets laptop to work. This is, is, a, is a one atmosphere suit. So this is the modern equivalent of, of that. This is cutting edge technology. It's like a wearable submarine that looks like a, an armored spacesuit. Now this will allow someone like me to go to 600 meters deep. Okay, so to give you an idea, that's 61 times atmospheric pressure. Normal diving, you could never go that deep. But this suit is just a submarine. It keeps you at, at basically your body pressure at sea level. But it's um, it's quite restricted, it's quite heavy, and it's very, very, very expensive. And you actually need a huge boat to um, to launch this this diving suit from. So as much fun as it is, um, we tend to use slightly different equipment. Now, the equipment we use, you carry in your back and you dive. But I want to mention briefly this. This is not me in a submarine. This is in a wet bell. So wet bell, all it is basically, if you took a, a, a glass and you turned it upside down and you plunged it underwater, you'd find there's still air trapped in the in the glass, you know, underwater. And we use that. So when we're diving very, very deep for, for long periods of time, we'll surface in this trapped area here just so we can take our mask off and our, and our breathing like loop, our mouthpiece out. 
and, uh, and just take a rest because sometimes we're underwater for a long, long, long time. Because again, these days to, to, to push the boundaries and explore new places, you could be spending four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours underwater. And some of that is to decompress. So if we go very, very, very deep, uh, this was on a, on a shipwreck dive where I was 120 meters down. And therefore my body is being uh, exposed to 13 times atmospheric pressure. Now that not only means I'm not breathing air any longer. If you breathe air at those sort of depths, it will kill you. You breathe a special mix of helium and nitrogen and oxygen. And, uh, but even then, you have to come back to the surface very, 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 very slowly to let your body decompress. And how that works is if you imagine you've got a bottle of Coca-Cola and you shake it up and then you take the top off really quickly, it'll explode, right? However, if you shake it really hard and you, and you just slowly and carefully take the top off, you can release the gas safely. So that's what we do. We basically, when we go on a long, deep dive, it's like shaking a body up, making it full of gas, which means you've got to go back to the surface nice and slowly so the gas escapes from your body slowly and you don't bubble up. So what do we use to dive? Well, there's two things I use. One is scuba gear, traditional scuba gear, and one is rebreathers. So scuba gear, you're probably familiar with, big set of tanks on your back and away you go and you breathe the gas, and when you breathe out, the bubbles go out into the sea, or the lake, or the river, or wherever you are. Now, normally you see them mounting people's backs, but actually sometimes we mount them uh, on our side. So I've got two tanks there, one either side, under my armpits, basically. And that's to make us as low profile and narrow as possible, because sometimes when you're exploring new places, here's a cave system, and it's quite a big cave here, but sometimes the caves aren't always quite so big. So you can just make that, that's me, and I'm trying to squeeze through a space that's about that size. So having those cylinders on my side rather than on my back makes life a lot. Uh, so is it easier? I'm not sure it's all that easy. Um, and you know, things like this, that the hole is just, that's the size of the hole there. The little thing there that I'm trying to crawl out of. So, um, but, scuba here. But what I mainly use now is a thing called a rebreather. You see a lot of shots, uh, most of the rest of the shots of me will be using a, what's called a rebreather. On my back, big loop all the way around like that. You'll notice on the on the other one, the scuba gear, I've got one hose coming out one side and that's it. There's only one hose because all the air's got to do is come in. Whereas a rebreather, there's two hoses. Now a rebreather, that's the same equipment that astronauts use when they're doing spacewalks. And basically what it does is it recycles one breath. So I breathe out, my breath goes round this tube into the thing in my back. That's full of a thing that looks like, it looks like cat litter, to be honest. And that absorbs the carbon dioxide that I've breathed out. And it comes back around this loop, tiny bit of oxygen is pumped back in, and I breathe it in. I breathe out, it goes through here, and I breathe it back in, and that, so it's called a rebreather, because you're rebreathing the same breath again and again and again. And that means I can spend up to sort of eight, nine, ten hours underwater and go much deeper for much longer. So that limit of exploration is pushed even further out. The bit of tech I love to use, as quickly mentioned, is this. It's got a DPV, a diver propulsion vehicle, an underwater scooter, and it just saves you, it's much faster than swimming. You can, you can fly along underwater, which is really good fun. So that's all equipment that we might use. What do we do? Well, there's a, a different set of things that we'll go and explore. explore. Uh, and one of them is shipwrecks. The chance to explore shipwrecks is a chance to take a look into the past. And often um, when things sink under the ocean or, or are covered by waters, be it you know, sea level rise or, or when lakes are formed, it preserves things far better than they would be on land because it supports the structure. And this is a classic example, this is Britannic. This is the twin sister of Titanic, which I'm sure you've heard of, one of the most famous ships in the world. And she looks just like Titanic. And she lies at the bottom of the, uh, the Aegean Sea off the coast of Greece. And she was sunk when she was being used as a hospital ship back in World War I. And the thing about Britannic is that, um, you know, that it's this huge shipwreck, but 
we can't send ROVs inside and we can't send big submarines inside, they're too big. So we have to send divers. This is me and a, and a friend about to enter this little hole here to look inside Britannic. But shipwrecks and plane wrecks, things that sink at sea, isn't the only type of history that we've gone and kind of rediscovered or explored using, uh, you know, uh, us divers. There's also flooded mines. So a lot of mines around the world, mine, mining's been a huge part of, 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 of sort of mankind's development for, for years, especially in the UK. Uh, that's where I'm based right now. Uh, you know, we've been mining since the Paleolithic time, so for tens of thousands of years. So all in the world, you've got these mines, and often they dug so deep that eventually they got below the water table, and then when the mines were abandoned, they flooded, which is fantastic because this cold water preserves wood, fabric, all these sort of things far, far better than it would be if it was on land and exposed to the air. So this actually one is one up in, uh, in Finland, uh, which means it was very, 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 very cold. But, I mean, the site you can see is incredible. And here, as you can see, actually one point, I'm coming through this doorway, there's a door frame, all the wood is perfectly preserved. Um, there's even a little bridge here, a walkway and a bridge, which, and you wouldn't get that level of preservation um, on land. So underwater archaeologists can discover things which land archaeologists can't because these structures on land would have rotted away and, and completely turned to dust years and years ago, but they're preserved underwater. And I'm going to show you just one little thing. One second. Apologies, that was my five-year-old. <laughs> so I want to show you a little clip that um, we'll just talk through if it, if it, if it all pans out. After more than four hours of preparation, it's time to go in. But all on their safety line and make the sense. This is a mine in the UK, it's an old slate mine. And no one had dived this until, since it was closed down. No one had been in it since it was closed down over like 80 years ago. And you can see the tunnels here, the trail train tracks that run down there, how well preserved they are. And that's footage from like the 1930s of them. An old train trail ca cart that would have loaded the, the slate up on to bring back the surface. These carts I could see down there. Some of the old machinery, again, you know, this would have rusted away on land, uh, but it's very well preserved. And that would have hauled the, um, the, 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 the carts back up. But the most impressive thing was coming up in a second here. So this here, I'm just pause that. This is graffiti. It's graffiti left by the miners in, uh, in 1938. And that's still there to be discovered. And things like that, you know, in, in mines today. So that's pretty incredible. So I want to move away from history and then look at you know, natural sciences. And um, one, of the, one of the great things I've done is, is dive up in the Arctic and in Greenland. And actually sometimes you think about the sides of icebergs and glaciers, you think, well, it's a block of ice, you can't dive that. But actually the, water, the movement of water in, a, in an iceberg, is really, a glacier, is really important to icebergs and how they carve. And we had a chance to dive one of these, a blue lake, a big lake that forms in the depression of... Uh, in, in glaciers, and the reason we're diving it was we're trying to work out how they flood, sorry, how they how they empty and where they go, because what happens with these big blue lakes is that as the glacier moves, a crack, a crevasse will open up in the bottom, like a plug hole, and the water will drain through. And what happens, it drains all the way at the bottom of the glacier, and it lubricates, it, it, it makes the bottom more slippery. So actually the glacier picks up speed, it moves uh, faster towards its its calving front, which means the more water that drains down into the glacier, the more and the bigger icebergs that are created at the far end. And that's the sort of things we're diving can add to, to sciences like, like glaciology. The water clearly is freezing cold, uh, but it is crystal clear and it was a phenomenal place to go diving. You know, one of the other natural places that I do a lot of diving personally is inside caves. You know, that's going to be geology and really air sciences. And there are some, you know, just phenomenal, uh, like beautiful alien worlds to go and explore. And if you really want to be an explorer and you want to make life easy for yourself, become a cave diver because there are still hundreds of thousands of miles of underwater cave left to explore all around the world. Even here in the UK, I've mapped brand new cave systems uh, and we're still doing it. And we would do it right now, in fact, if it wasn't for the uh, coronavirus from, from some of the, the clips here. 
And what's great is that you can go to these places and you can bring back data as a cave diver that the geologists and the natural scientists can't reach because they don't have the, the diving skills. So you can work as a team. You know, they tell you the data, the samples that they need. You go into these sort of places and you get those samples, bring it back to them, and they can analyze it and, and put it to good use. Um, and again, but what you get is, there's my friend Phil, and there's me having a good time in the background, um, is you get places where no human being has ever been before. You know, I've been in, in underwater and on dry chambers. Literally, I was the first human being to ever go there, and that's true exploration. That's true, the real potential of, of, of cave diving. I will just mention that if you want to uh, do a sort of virtual cave dive, you can. Um, again, you can't read that. Oh, you, no, you can't read that on that camera. Basically, on Vimeo, if you search for Sunto Diving uh, 360 Cave Film, so that's, you can't read it, but it's S U U N T O, Sunto 360 Cave Diving Film. There should be a cave diving film on there, it's perfectly free, that you can look at uh, on your phone and do a sort of virtual cave dive with me in France, which. Uh, is something. Now, well, I've got sort of five minutes left. I want to give some time to questions, but what I want to touch on is this. I've shown you cave diving. I've shown you deep, deep technical diving. I've shown you rebreathers and all that sort of high-tech kit. But as I said at the start, being an underwater explorer is very, very easy because there's so much left to explore. So you don't need all that sort of stuff. All you need is a snorkel, a little plastic tube, and that's something that anyone can go and do. You, me, anyone can go snorkeling. It's not difficult. It doesn't require any high-tech expensive kit. It doesn't require any skill, really. And everything I've spoken about, you can do with a snorkel. You can go and look at shipwrecks and explore shipwrecks. You can, and it's not only in the sea, rivers. You know, it's me snorkeling just under a waterfall in Wales in a river. High altitude lakes. This is uh, the highest lake in, in the UK. It's actually a loch in Scotland uh, near the mountain of Briariach. Uh, this is me in the rain. Uh, this is snow. And this was the summertime in Scotland, but there we go. Um, you know, on the on the, the Arctic trips, I've done snorkeling around icebergs. Um, for you know, again, just gathering data for signs. You don't always need to go underwater. Sometimes snorkeling is all you need. But one of the best things about snorkeling is that when it comes to wildlife, and this is a wildlife TV channel after all, um, I've done a lot of wildlife filming and expeditions all around the world, but most of which have been underwater. But the rebreathers, the submersibles, the submarines, the scuba gear, all that's great. But the best experiences I've had, the closest experiences I've had with wildlife underwater has been with nothing more um, dramatic than a little plastic tube, a snorkel. Because most of the life in the in the ocean is on the surface. It's, it's where the sunlight is. We've got life all the way down to very, very depths, but the most diversity and the most numbers is all up on the surface. So all these pictures you see here were all taken, not by me, I submit, by my friend Dan Bolt, but all taken around the UK and on a snorkel. You can get up close and personal with a snorkel, far more so you can with that bulky, heavy, noisy dive equipment. Um, and especially big animals, you know, close encounters with grey seals, big grey seals here, such good fun. Uh, harbour seals, uh, basking shark, whale sharks, manta rays, all the close encounters of having these big, impressive, spectacular underwater animals has all happened with just a mask and snorkel. And because it's the UK and our waters are quite cold, a wetsuit, because I'm not that stupid. And of course, everyone loves them. Sharks. This is actually not in the UK, admittedly. Although we do get lots of great sharks in the UK. Thresher's Makos, uh, poor beagles, obviously the basking shark, second biggest fish in the sea, over 25 foot long, all at the west coast uh, over the summer. Uh, this is a, a Mako shark, the fastest, the fastest shark in the world. And this is me off the coast of California. Again, just you see there, just just snorkeling, just snorkeling. And even on even on land, I find that you, can get, you can get closer to wildlife on land. Sometimes I'll go bird watching with a mask and snorkel. So I can float down the river, in the middle of the river, just there, just there, sight of a black hood on, so you can't really see me, and I'll float down the river just gently, and all the bird life on the banks will, will stay where they are. But if someone walks past, they're gone. So actually, snorkeling is a great way to watch, to watch birds on the riverbank. Before I finish, I'll just touch on um, um, 
sort of underwater exploration in terms of medical science because sometimes we can do stuff experiments when we're diving to help medical science and uh, I'll show you this this was a, a experiment in created by a friend of mine called Dr Chris Van Tolken and if you know him he it, with his brother Zan they present a thing called Operation Ouch and um, I should say that Chris is also a real life doctor in fact he specializes in infectious diseases uh, and med infectious medicine so he's very very busy right now but this is us um Chris, this, his, this idea that um, we would test our ability to control our reaction to cold water shock. So what he did was he decided that he and I would jump into the Arctic Ocean, which is zero degrees in our pants. So there I go. It's not too bad. Very, very, very cold. And here's Chris. I love showing that. Okay, folks, we've got, I think actually I'm going to have one minute over, um, but until Lizzie comes online and tells me to get off, I'll answer a few questions. Um, is going deep in the ocean more dangerous than going into space? Um, depends how deep you go. I mean, the problem, the problem is when often we go on expeditions, uh, we are on our own, there's two or three of us. You know, we haven't got this amount of backup they have in space. That said... Um, it's easier to get rescued. So I would still suggest, no, it's still it's still more hardcore to go into space than it is underwater. And given the chance, I would love to go into space. Um, what's the deepest depth you've gone? I've done 184 meters. So that would be 19 and a half times atmospheric pressure in depth. Uh, what's the biggest thing you've seen underwater? Um, biggest thing I've seen underwater, a basking shark. I've never dived um, with whales yet, or or um, a whale shark. So a basking shark, which is you know can be almost thirty feet long. We get them off the UK every summer. That's probably the biggest thing I've dived wildlife-wise underwater. Um, what is your favourite place you've dived? Oh God, there's been so many of them. I mean, over in the UK is great. Except with basking sharks and grey seals in the UK, off coral reefs in the Philippines, um, with manta rays and big, 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 big barracuda off uh, of Mozambique. The Britannic was an amazing shipwreck. I mean, the Arctic and up around Greenland, diving around icebergs is is just does blow your mind visually. It's just it is like being on an alien planet. So there's an awful lot to choose from. Um, are there any associated companies that we can follow to learn more to, and get involved? You know, if you really want to get to, to the, the underwater world, then you've got to start to learn to dive. Um, and there's lots of different agencies out there. What I would say is the agents are all agencies, training agencies are all great, but um, it's kind of irrelevant. The, the, you need a good instructor. Uh, it doesn't matter which training agency he belongs to or she belongs to. It's all about how good an instructor they are. If you want to go down this route, then, um, then you know, you need to, you need to train, basically. Um, we've got here. What's your favourite dive set, both in caves and traditional scuba diving? I mean, you know, I'm a, I do, I've got quite into cave diving uh, in the last few years, especially, um, probably because I do get seasick. So, you know, not too bad, but I do get seasick. So if it's like, you know, out in the middle of the ocean, then I'm always like, oh, God, you know, look at the weather forecast first. You don't get sick cave diving, or usually you don't get sick cave diving. Um, do you still do in and outs? Oh, that's that's uh, one more uh, diving. So I was a diver in the army as well, actually. So, um, there used to be this punishment where they made you do basically jump in the water, climb out, jump in the water, climb out, jump in the water, climb out as a punishment because the water was freezing and it was a lot of hard work. Uh, and I don't do that anymore. I don't do self-punishment anymore. Um, what else have we got here? I think, I think, oh, I don't know. Well, I think, guys, I've already overrun by a few minutes. So um, that's it for me. Uh, thank you very, very much for watching. Uh, and there'll be another presenter on tomorrow. Um, I think there's actually another one today. I'm not sure. But anyway, check out Lizzie's channel, uh, this channel. Uh, there'll be these live sessions going on from now all the way through, I think, till the, the middle of May. If the current situation carries on, who knows? She might carry on longer than that. But at the moment, it's, it's all up to me. And all these, all the programs of mine today and all the ones that have been before me in the last week or so are all still available on Lizzie's YouTube channel. So um, apart from that, 
stay safe, take care, and uh, I'll see you again. Thanks very much for watching.